Luke 19. So last week, if you weren't with us, we, we talked about the fact that the, the, the book of Luke is, is entering into a transition now. Um, the middle section of Luke has been largely compiled of, of story, or not, not stories, I'm sorry, the teachings of Jesus. So, so he's teaching his disciples about all sorts of things. It's just teaching, 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 parables, stories, teachings. But, but now, instead of the more static teaching environments, we're moving now into stories that are going to be more active progressions because Jesus is now making his way literally directly towards the city of Jerusalem. He's en route to the city of Jerusalem where it's going to be Passover season. And as we know, he's going to the cross specifically to die. So we're in the last, uh, last couple of weeks of Jesus' life now as we're reading this story, his pre-resurrection life. Because, uh, spoiler alert, he's alive. Amen? But that's what we're doing. So, so Jesus is making his way to Passover. And that's really important. So Passover there, as you know, and we talked about this in a little more detail last week. Passover is the celebration of the fact that that God had delivered Israel from slavery um, because of the sacrifice and applied blood of a spotless lamb. And so now Jesus, making his way to Jerusalem where he will be the spotless lamb who will die on Passover to deliver us from slavery, from sin, to deliver us from our Pharaoh who is Satan. And so, so this is where Jesus is headed. Now, also, if you know this, you know that in Jerusalem on Passover, super busy, right? It, it's the mall or Costco on Black Friday. It, it's that kind of scenario. It's incredibly crowded because everyone is making their way there. And so as he's making his way there, um, we find even in verse 1 of our text here, it says, he, speaking of Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And Jericho is kind of like the perfect rest stop sort of town on your way to Passover. So if you're coming from the southern part of Israel, Jericho was this really lush city. It had great water. Um, It's like a desert oasis, literally in the middle of the desert. If you've gone with us to Israel, or hopefully we get a chance to do that again soon, um, you're coming from like the Dead Sea area where it's just brown desert. But Jericho is a place where there's like great water, there's lush pine trees, and it's a really good place to stop over on your way to Jerusalem. Um, And you'll hear things like going up to Jerusalem because Jericho is literally 820 feet below sea level, which is crazy when you look at the map because it's not far from the ocean, but it's 825 feet below sea level. But Jerusalem, which is only 20 miles away, is 3,440 feet above Jericho. So the road that goes from Jericho to Jerusalem is all uphill, 20 miles, and Jericho kind of became that pit stop before you make your way there. So if if Israel, or excuse me, if, if Jerusalem is really crowded because of the Passover holiday, then that means now a week or two beforehand, Jericho is really crowded because it's going to be filled with pilgrims who, like Jesus, are making their way to Jerusalem. So Jericho's packed. Um, All the crowds, when Jesus does the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, many of them now are actually in Jericho because they're traveling there in the same way that Jesus is. So really, really crowded city, teeming with people. Now, last week, we saw Jesus' interaction with a poor beggar named Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, at the city gate as he was coming into Jerusalem. Now, this week, we're going to get kind of the opposite. We're going to get Jesus' interaction with a very, very wealthy man inside the city. And the ultimate goal of each one of these interactions is exactly the same. That salvation has come to these people at the city of Jericho, okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read through this. I'm going to give you a little bit more background, and then we're going to sort of walk quickly through the narrative, and then I'm just going to give you three things that we can learn um, and admire and honor about Zacchaeus. Um, How is it that such salvation came to Zacchaeus? How is it that such a change took place in the life of Zacchaeus? And then we're going to flip that a little bit, and we're going to look at this same interaction from the perspective of Jesus, but the points will be sort of the same. And you'll see what I'm talking about there. So, Jesus coming through Jericho, and it says in verse 2, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector, and he was rich. 
Now, I, I know that we did some of this background before, but especially for those of you who might be on that two times a month or less coming to church and you might have missed this before, it's really important to the story to understand the depths of hatred people would have for a guy like Zacchaeus. Okay, so Zacchaeus is a tax collector, and you think, oh, well, of course, we all hate to pay taxes. And if there was one guy in, you know, like let's say in your neighborhood, there was one guy whose job it was to come and collect your taxes every year when it was time to pay taxes, I would imagine if you look out the window of your house and you see him coming up the driveway, there would be a little bit of ugh when you saw that, right? That's not what we're talking about. This isn't he's hated because we have to give him money. This is way deeper and way more disturbing than that. So you have to understand the city of Jerusalem, or excuse me, the city of Jericho here, as well as Israel as a whole, as well as the entire known world is under the oppressive thumb of Rome. Rome is the superpower in the world at this time, and they rule everything. And, and actually, they ruled everything with surprisingly little issues surprisingly few um, revolts. There's not a lot of civil wars to read about. There's not a lot of wars within Roman-controlled territory to, re to read about. They actually ruled it pretty well, I mean, from their perspective. They really had a hold on things. So how do you do that? Especially in a day and age when you're ruling such vast territory, there's no missiles, no airplanes, no helicopters, there's no way to quickly deal with an uprising if it pops up somewhere. And then on top of that, even if an uprising pops up in a place like Jericho, which is far from Rome, if, if something like that was to happen, it would take forever just for word to get from Jericho to Rome to tell them that it was going on in the first place, much less a response. And the way that Rome did this, the way they controlled the world like that, is by having armies that were inhabiting all of these different areas everywhere. They would raise up these big armies, and they would put them in these different cities and in these different strategic locations, and that army would rule that area through fear and intimidation. Um, there, there's historical writings that talk about the fact that in one city, for example, Rome came in, their army came in, and they captured 20,000 men, women, and children. 20,000, and took them outside the gates of the city and crucified all of them. 20,000 people outside the, all of the entrances into that city, hung up on crosses and stakes and killed, and then left there. And the reason was... Anyone coming or going would see, this is what it looks like if you mess with us. We are in control, we are in charge, and it was, it was an intimidation factor. It was to get ahead of and to say, you don't mess with us. But here's the deal. The armies that lived in those areas that, uh, uh, that did such atrocities to the people like that were funded through the taxes paid by the people who lived there. And those taxes were collected by, you might say, native citizens. So that means an Israeli citizen would be hired by Rome to collect the taxes that fund the army to keep the army trained, fed, and supplied so that they could continue to oppress your people. And just, you have to think, like, think how personal that is. I mean, Medford's what, 80, 90,000 people, something like that in population? Imagine 20,000 people in Medford taken and put on each end of I-5 and crucified and hung there. We would know some of them, right? Some of them are going to be family. Like, this would become intensely personal. But now imagine your next-door neighbor is the guy who goes and gets the money to make sure that that army is able to do that kind of stuff to you. There's really no modern equivalent for the kind of hatred that the Jewish people would have towards tax collectors. Then add to that that Rome would set a quota, you need to collect this much money, anything above that is yours. So those tax collectors would go and at times, using the Roman army, through force would collect extra money and that's where their wealth came from. Later here in the narrative, you'll see where, where he says, I'm going to give back the money to those that I've defrauded. That word is actually extorted, extortion. So he's saying, 
the money that I took from people through this sort of force, I'm going to give that back. So if that was your neighbor, if Zacchaeus lived next door, or if we were here at a church gathering and Zacchaeus walked in, what would you think? Like, what would go through your mind? It's a level of hatred we can't even imagine. And, and that's what it means. So when it says there's a tax collector, this is the kind of guy we're talking about. And then on top of all that, he's not just a tax collector, he's the tax collector. It says he's the chief tax collector, and then it adds in to let you know, and he's rich. He has made a lot of money doing that to your people. So you can imagine his popularity status amongst the Jewish people in Jericho, right? But this is who's there. And in verse 3 it says, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. So he's heard about Jesus, as many have. Um, he's heard about the commotion and all these things. He's heard stories, but now he wants to see who he is for himself, which I think is an important part of this narrative. So he wants to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. So um, holiday season, it's if you've gone to a Christmas parade before, that was the big event in the town that I grew up in in Asheville, North Carolina. And if you didn't get there early enough, you had to go further and further down the parade route to find a place where you could get to where you could actually see. And so Zacchaeus, as the song says, and you're welcome for me not singing the song, by the way. Zacchaeus, who is a wee little man, can't see because of the crowd. And so he goes further down the route, the parade route, you might say, the city street that's coming in, finds this big sycamore tree. And he climbs up in this tree so that he can see over the crowd to see Jesus as he's coming in. And so then the text goes on. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Now, this is almost rude in this culture. Now, Israelite culture at this time was very hospitable. So if you ran across a traveler who was making their way through another Jewish brother of yours, um, it was often incumbent upon you to be the one who takes them into the house and says, no, 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 you come stay with me. I'll take care of you. You can come and, and, and crash at our place and have food, you know, that kind of a thing. That's kind of how it worked. But you didn't do it in reverse. Like it would be considered almost rude for someone to say, hey, I'm staying with you. And the level, the, the, the amount of shockwaves that would have gone through that crowd that's following Jesus, even amongst his own disciples, when they would see, what, him? That's the guy you're picking? That's the house? Out of anywhere you could stay, you picked, like, there's literally not a worse place to stay. Like, you, there's nowhere in the city you could stay worse than that. And that's the guy? That's the house? That's where you want to go? And he says, no, hurry, come on down, man, we're going. I'm staying at your house, is what Jesus says. Now, Zacchaeus, I love this reaction. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. I, I, I think right here you're already seeing the transformation that has happened in the heart of Zacchaeus because it wouldn't be common that a tax collector would hear from a Jewish rabbi, come here, I want to talk to you, and he's happy about it. It would not have been a jovial relationship between the two of them. But Zacchaeus is excited. He hurries down the tree and he's like, I can't believe this. He's like, let's go, let's go and do this. And so they make their way down in verse 7. And when they saw it, and we all know who they is, right? They. They talk a lot, don't they? And they grumble a lot, don't they? Not just they, they, all the they's. They talk a lot, don't they? Well, they saw it. And they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now, that is religious language, but it's more than just he's someone who sins, therefore he's a sinner. It's an absolute insult. It, it's he's staying with a sinner. Like there, there's a, a disgust to this, to use that word in that culture. He has gone in. You're telling me, out of any, he has gone in to be in the house 
I'm a sinner? It's disgust. Zacchaeus, he stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Now, this is more than the law requires. Um, The Jewish law, if you had taken money from someone, you were required to give it back, and I believe it was a 5% or something like that um, uh, 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 restitution fee, you might say, that you would give back to the person that you had wronged. This guy is going above and beyond, which makes sense. He's a rich man, and I believe this is showing a heart of wanting to sacrifice as well as genuine remorse for the things that have done. And a 5% give back when the, with the kind of wealth he has, you don't feel that. This is him saying, I am going to make a sacrifice to pay back these people to give. Like, this guy's whole world has changed. You're talking about a guy who has gone from looking down his nose at the poor, because everyone in the culture did that, um, to now giving half of what he owned to all the poor. You're talking about a guy who has gotten rich and made his living by extorting money away from everyone else, now not just repaying it, but four times what he had taken from them previously. This guy has completely changed because of his interactions with Jesus. It's It's really a remarkable transformation. And so Jesus said to him, verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. Now remember, what are the people outside, what are they calling him? Sinner. What does Jesus call him? Son of Abraham. Which, if you're God, and Abraham is your chosen people, it's another way of saying, he's mine not sinner. He's mine. He's my son. He's my child. He's my chosen. It's amazing the difference of how these two groups, if you will, see Zacchaeus in this moment now. And then Jesus gives us his mission statement. He says, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. This is what Jesus is doing. Remember, he's going to Jerusalem right now to die. And the reason he came is to seek and save the lost, the sinners, the Zacchaeuses, the blind Bartimaeuses. He came for that purpose, and he's tre- the, the only reason he's in Jericho at that time is because he's going to Jerusalem to die for the likes of Zacchaeus. His mission is to save the lost. That is the purpose and the will of Jesus Christ. Pretty cool story, eh? How many of us have heard this story before? Hands raised? Lots, almost everybody, right? Lots of us have. It's a pretty cool story, and it really is, and I hope our familiarity with it um, does not um, dilute the fact that there's a remarkable transformation that's happening here. I mean, it's really remarkable that this guy would go from the kind of person he is to giving all this away. Salvation has truly come. So the question is then, how does that happen? Like, how do we, or whether it's, us for our own lives or or you for your own life here as you sit today, how do you get that sort of like life-changing, radically life-changing salvation to flow through your life? Or even as we're witnessing to others and sharing with others, like how do we lead people to this? Like that's remarkable transformation that I think any of us would love to see happening either in our own lives or in the lives of some people around us that, that just don't know Jesus. So how do we do this? So I'm going to point out three things that I think that, that we, need to point, uh, we need to take note of that Zacchaeus does in this. And the first sounds simplistic, but it's so not. The first is this. For, th- for that sort of salvation, that sort of change to happen in the life of a person, uh, number one is this. You have to be willing to climb the tree. And here's what I mean by that. No no men, men don't climb trees. Kids climb trees. Now, I know, a bunch of us men in here, we still once in a while see a tree with good branches. You guys know what that means, right? Like you see the tree with good climbable branches and you're like, oh, I could climb all the way to the top of that tree. And maybe if no one's looking, you would do it. But dignity in front of other people, you're not going to climb that tree. It's just not what happens. And in that culture especially, no way would a man climb that tree. First of all, there's a wardrobe issue, right? Girls can tell you about that because if you ever tried to climb a tree in your Sunday dress, you got in trouble, right? 
It's not appropriate. So there's a wardrobe issue for guys there, but it's more than that. It's an honor society, dignity issue where the entire social class is built on how do people view me and trying to achieve some level, whether looking down your nose at those who are beneath you or trying to, to be esteemed in front of others. And men in that culture, you do not run, but he runs, and you do not climb trees, and he climbs that tree. So what does that mean? Well, first of all is this, it means that... T- to understand, believe, and apply the gospel to your life, you first of all need to be willing to set aside your dignity. Because acceptance of the gospel and, and receiving Jesus as Savior starts with admitting that you don't have it all together, that you aren't perfect, and that you can't save yourself. So there's a certain amount of humbling that has to take place from the very, very beginning. That's why in the Beatitudes, Jesus teaches, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And when he says that, he doesn't mean uh, money poor. He's like, those who are spiritually bankrupt are in the perfect position to inherit the kingdom of God. Because there has to be a divestment of all of the things that we would cling to for our own worth. And an acceptance that it is only the righteousness of Jesus Christ that saves us. So there has to be a certain amount of humbling, uh, of willing to set aside your dignity for that. Uh, But even more so, if we can use the analogy of kids climb trees and adults do, or adults don't. um, There's this understanding that for this kind of transformation to happen in your life, Jesus said it himself, you have to become like a child. So look at the text in Matthew 18. Look what Jesus said. And speaking of Jesus, it says, and calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So let's think about how we raise our kids. Um, It's the Christmas season. And uh, if anyone has a small child in here, you you probably are going to want to cover ears or get them out of the room really, really quick. I'm not going to be inappropriate, but I'm going to totally blow some Christmas surprises potentially depending on how you raise your kids. Five, four, three, you've been warned, one. Okay, I'm just guessing that now no one in here still believes in Santa Claus. And I don't mean, don't get all historical, no, there really was a Saint Nick. He was actually this, and nah, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Santa Claus, reindeer, chimneys, gifts. I'm just assuming there's no adults in here that do. And if one did, I would love to have lunch with you and just ask questions. Because I, I just can't imagine the layers of delusion that, that you have to get through to believe. I, I can't imagine, like, what are the circumstances in your life that you haven't figured this out yet? Or have people in your life been the greatest trick players in the world, and they have pulled this off on you because I want to meet them? But no one in here really believes that there's an overweight dude at the North Pole in a red suit, in a sleigh pulled by flying reindeer, who's going to cover the entire world in 24 hours. I just traveled from halfway around the world. I know that can't be done. He's going to come down your chimney, even if you don't have one. We've never dealt with that as a society, have we? But he's going to come down your chimney, even if you don't have a chimney. He's going to pull that off. I know that one movie, the chimney just appears, right? That's a cop out. Anyway, you don't really believe that in the middle of the night, he's going to land on your roof, come down your chimney or not a chimney, into your house, He's going le- to break and enter, not steal, leave, leave gifts because of a list you gave him when you met him at the mall a month ago. He's going to eat your cookies and milk, get back on the roof, and the reindeer will fly him to the next house. And yet we've never seen him, we've never taken photos, none of that kind of stuff. Like, nobody really believes that. Because at a certain point you go, okay, all right, it, it's time to talk about reality versus fairy tale. And maybe we can bridge the two somehow and talk about the moral lessons behind them or the intentions or the, you know, that kind of stuff. But at a certain point, we as a society do say part of growing up is understanding what is reality and what is not and living in reality, right? That's what we say. Well, look what C.S. Lewis said. He knows something about uh, fairy tales and stories, does he not? Look what he said. As an adolescent, I would have been ashamed to have been found reading fairy tales. 
When you become a teenager, or so you are told, you can't read fairy tales. You can't believe in witches or other worlds or that sort of thing. As an adolescent, I would have been ashamed to have been found reading fairy tales. Now that I'm 50, I read them in public, and this is a great quote. For when I became a man, I put away childish things, especially the fear of childishness. That's a money quote right there. Especially the fear of childishness. Let's talk for just a second about what we actually believe. Just being practical. We believe that God spoke the entire world into existence. That the first human couple was fooled by a talking snake. We believe that over a piece of fruit. We believe that God split the Red Sea. We believe in angels. We believe in all sorts of miracles. We believe that the earth is covered in a darkness that sometimes we can see visibly and sometimes we cannot. We believe there are two spiritual worlds in another dimension that are at war with one another, a, a, a dimension of light, a dimension of darkness. We believe that this battle is taking place. We believe that God himself became flesh and was born to a virgin as a baby. That he lived a perfect life, never sinned or messed up or dishonored his father even once. That he died on the cross, that he rose again on the third day. That he then lifted up into heaven, has ascended to the right hand of the throne of God. And that if we put our faith in him, that we will one day live in this new kingdom to come called heaven. That we will live with him forever. Now, there is an absolute element of childlike faith that is required to say, I believe that. And now you go, oh, man. So he's just saying that Christianity is just another fairy tale. Absolutely not what I'm saying. Christianity is the reality that every other fairy tale points to. That's what I'm saying. That our, our obsession with superheroes, our obsession with happily ever after, our obsession with princess fairy tales and, and all of these sorts of things, that all of that points to a deep soul understanding of the reality that those things are true. And a deep understanding in our soul that knows that Jesus is who he says he is. But if we just take the approach of the way that the rest of the world is now and we just look at it and go, yeah, but it's, it's not reality based on what we can see. You'll always be outside of the salvation that Jesus has to offer. Because understanding comes after faith. We saw that in last week's story, right? So this is true. You, you remember... One of my favorite, there's actually a lot of movies now about this, like, don't really grow up. I haven't seen this one yet, but I heard that the new Christopher Robin movie is about that, and somebody said it's a tear fest, so I'm not watching that one. But, um, but one of my favorites is Hook. Remember Hook? With uh, Robin Williams was in it. And, and in, there's one scene in there where one of the boys from Neverland is talking to a police officer, and he says to him, he's, I've forgotten how to fly. And the cop says what? He says, one does. But the gospel says one doesn't have to. The gospel says, no, no, no. There's a reality here that we are called to put our faith in. And Zacchaeus, he was willing to say, I'm willing to look like a fool in the eyes of other people to believe in something. Where the rest of the world would say, you Christians, you just believe in fairy tales. And we would say, no, 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 no. your fairy tales point to the reality. And one day our faith will be made sight. So to be saved and to be transformed by the spirit of God takes an element of willingness to I'll just be a kid and climb the tree amen number two you have to get over the crowd you have to get over the crowd I think this one's awesome to think about so first of all what crowd in the story what is this crowd it's a nasty self-righteous legalistic moralistic crowd it's they that's who this is and so here's the deal Zacchaeus has heard about Jesus, but now he can't see him. He's never seen him for himself, and now he can't see him because of the crowd. And he refused to settle for seeing Jesus through the crowd and the stories he had heard. And he refused to not see for himself. So he got to a vantage point to get above the crowd and to look and to see who Jesus was literally and specifically for himself. And here's what I'm saying by this. It, 
I believe the number one reason that people don't get saved is their pride, an unwillingness to be childlike and to humble yourself and, and all that kind of stuff. But I believe one of the number uh, two, or maybe number two hurdle that can happen out there, especially in the world out there, um, is this unwillingness to follow Jesus because their idea of who Jesus is has been determined by interactions with self-righteous, moralistic people, not by them seeing who Jesus is for themselves. And so they see Jesus through their interactions with the crowds that either do or claim to follow Jesus without actually stopping to see Jesus himself. And Zacchaeus wasn't cool with that. He said, I'm not going to let my interactions with these crowds that follow him be the thing that determines who he is. I need to see for myself. And too many people won't walk through the doors of the churches because of their in, the inconsistencies that they believe they see within church people because of legalistic or, or pride or any of those kinds of things. And if they would just, if, if we would lead them, or if you're here and you're that, maybe you're here, the only reason you're here is because you came home from th- for Thanksgiving. But listen, if you will get past, look, there are lots of inconsistencies among people who follow Jesus. This room's full of them. I am the chiefest. Like, we are all that way. I will never try to prove to you why hypocrisy in the church doesn't exist. It's not true. It absolutely exists. But here's the thing. If you would push past and go, I don't want to forget the crowds that are following. I want to see who Jesus is myself. If, and, and we do this through his word. The Bible tells us the, that the word became flesh, that this is who Jesus is. We learn about this from here. If you go to the book yourself, you know what you see? You see, here's an example. Every time, every time that there's an opportunity to either choose the religious person or the sinner, every time he picks the sinner, without exception. Just in the book of Luke alone, Luke 7, there's a woman of the streets versus the religious leader. Luke 10, there's the Samaritan and the Levite. Luke 15, the elder brother, the younger brother. Luke 19, where we are now, the infidel collaborator or the religious self-righteous crowd. And who does he choose to go to their home? Who's the house that he picks? Every single time, that's who he picks. It's almost, honestly, it's almost on every single page of the gospel accounts. That he's either lambasting the religious self-righteous or he's showing mercy to the quote-unquote the sinner. You go, why is that? Because the self-righteous don't need him. They think they got it all right. They think they're doing okay. They're not the place. It is always the one who's the farthest from Jesus when they hear about the grace of Jesus that, that seems to be able to see it or respond to it the soonest. And that is throughout the scriptures you see Jesus and see here's the deal in many places because of interactions with the church or with Christians or with hypocrisy or whatever many sinners believe that Jesus's uh, demeanor towards them is that he wants to chew them out for their sin and squash them that is not what you read when you read the gospel accounts of who Jesus is he's calling out the self-righteous and showing mercy to the sinner who will humble himself and come before him And so, can I just encourage you, listen, get over the crowd. Like, just get over they. They are terrible. We are terrible. Like, all of us that are, like, that sounds bad, now you're mad at me. That's not what I mean. But, like, the model, the goal is not the righteousness of the people that follow Jesus. It's the the person who the Jesus followers are following. And, And here in the Word, we have this incredible opportunity for you to see who he is. And look, don't miss out on him because of a legalistic upbringing. Don't miss out on him because you think something, but you've never really looked for yourself. Find out for yourself. See who he is. And then, and for the Christians that are in this room, let me say this as well. We should be in the word even more because we now have the responsibility to be the body of Christ. So we are now the manifestation of who Jesus is to the rest of the world. So in reading the Gospels and seeing who Jesus is, we get the opportunity to go, does my life look like this? And am I accurately accurately reflecting who Jesus is to the people around me? Or am I actually reflecting the very people that Jesus seemed to avoid in places? 
And that can be a tough gut check, but a healthy one for the church to do. But again, don't miss out on Jesus because of an interaction with a Jesus follower. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Amen? And then uh, number three, you have to take him home with you. You have to take him home with you. Um, This is about discipleship. And uh, let me just say, Jesus doesn't want to just save you so that he can check in every Sunday morning and then you're good. That's not what he wants. This might be another hurdle, but it's the reality. Jesus wants all of you. All of you. See, in this text where it talks about him being a guest at that home, all the words that are used to speak of the hospitality that Jesus is enjoying from Zacchaeus in this text, it's more than just a meal. Jesus spent the night there. In that culture, you didn't just have a meal with someone. It was part of a, 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 of a deep fellowship that would take place over a meal. And a meal would take a long period of time. And it, at dinner in particular, it went until night. And you would stay over in that house if you were a part of that. Like I believe Jesus spent the night there, that he lodged there, that he stayed with Zacchaeus, that it was more than just having a meal. And so let me point out two things on this. Number one, uh, the order. notice the order. Jesus didn't go, because you have decided to give all this money away and do all these good things, I will come into your home. That's not what happened. It's not, um, it, the, the order is, because you love me, I want to change. It's not, because I changed, now you can love me. Um, so Jesus wants access to our lives, and it is in that type of fellowship that changes begin to happen as Jesus becomes, as we open ourselves up to him fully in every area, that's what happens. And then the other thing is this, like, it's not just about adding Jesus to some area of our life where we go, okay, salvation has come because I have given Jesus Sunday morning or Wednesday night. That's not actually what's happening. Jesus wants all of you. You go, that sounds really prideful. And that sounds like a lot to ask. He gave all for you. And, and the difference is, is the, the, the part of us that has a hard time with believing that, that it's okay that Jesus wants everything is usually built in distrust that Jesus is actually for our good. It's usually built in feeling like if I give everything to Jesus, I'm going to miss out on everything else and that's not fair to me. And that is not fully understanding the reality of the kind of world we live in and the kind of situations that we're in, the depths of our own sin, and the fact that Jesus is for our joy. But Zacchaeus didn't just say, I believe, and that's it. Jesus didn't, he didn't just settle for belief. He wants fellowship. He wants relationship. The ultimate goal of everything is adoption. So you gotta, you gotta give in. And you gotta take Jesus home with you and to work with you and to school with you, and to play with you. And it's about opening our lives up to the reality of who Jesus is. And I'm telling you, when you do that, he does crazy things, incredible things, but but things that you will find that you will want him to do joyfully, just as Zacchaeus did. So you want to see the kind of transformation that has happened like Zacchaeus, whether it be in your own life or those that you're trying to lead to Jesus? Man, those are the things you tell him right there. You say, first of all, you've got to be willing to climb the tree. Childlike faith and set your dignity aside. You've got to be willing to climb the tree. Number two, you say, you've got to get over the crowd. Like, stop worrying about hypocrisy. Stop worrying about the whole comparison game. That's not the gospel. Get rid of all of that kind of stuff. And then number three, open your life to him. This isn't just a Sunday morning deal. This is about our lives and all of us. Amen? Okay, now three things quickly about how this is made possible from the, asp- from the, the view of Jesus. You guys are going to start coming to the 830 service because I've already gone longer than I did the 830 service. But here it is. Here's something to think about from Jesus' perspective that even makes this possible. Number one, what's point number one? Anybody know already? Jesus was willing to climb the tree. Think about this. He's on his way to Jerusalem to die in that very moment. Jesus was willing to climb the tree for someone like Zacchaeus. He was willing to climb the tree for someone like the blind beggar at the side of the road. That's the whole reason he came. Number two, Jesus got over the crowd. Think about this. I think this was a powerful one for me to be thinking about uh, the last couple of days. But think about this. 
Zacchaeus would have been the guy that all the religious people would have pointed fingers at and said, it's a sinner, look at him, it's that tax collector. But that's not actually who they're talking about anymore once Jesus comes into Zacchaeus' home. The person they're talking about with scorn is Jesus, not Zacchaeus. And the reason they're doing it is because of the shame of Zacchaeus that they are now associating with Jesus. You guys see that? Look at him. He's with a sinner. Church, that's what happened on the cross. On the cross, he became familiar with all all of our shame, all of our guilt, all of our sin was laid upon his shoulders, though he was perfectly innocent. And he was insulted and mocked and ridiculed because he had taken on our shame and our scorn. And he was fine with that. For the joy set before him, he got over the crowds that would point fingers. Because remember, all that scorn pointing at Jesus, you could read it as if they're yelling it at you. And he was saying, I'll take you anyway. I'll take on that scorn so that I can save Jeff. That's an incredible thing. That's an incredible thing. And then the last thing is this. Jesus takes us home with him. Jesus takes us home with him. The Bible says this. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it weren't so, I I wouldn't have told you that I was doing this. And he says, but I'm going so that what? Where I am, you may be also. The end result of salvation is not just more polished people. The end result of salvation is children in the house of God. The, The goal of Jesus is not, just think of it this way. Like God doesn't go, You're saved, and I look forward to seeing you on Sundays and on Wednesdays. But in the meantime, I'm kind of busy. I do have a universe to run, so just hang tight on your own. But I'll see you on Sunday. I'll see you on Wednesdays. I'll see you like uh, VBS when you're a kid. I'll see you during those periods of time. But the rest of the time, you're sort of on your own. I'll see you later. That's not what he's doing. The plan of God is he's raising children in his household. And one day, we will be with him in eternity forever ever and ever and ever. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Don't you, church? So listen, if you're here this morning and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you. Will you come talk to me? Come talk to one of the other pastors. Tap someone on the shoulder near you and just say, hey, how do I do this? But come talk to me because you, you need to meet Jesus. And I mean, meet Jesus for yourself, Okay. And then for the rest of us here, for the church, I want to encourage you guys, listen, be in the word. Read the stories of Jesus. Read about the life of Jesus. And and be in that place where you can not only worship and celebrate the salvation and the gospel applied to your own life, but to go, how do I reflect that reality to everyone else? As opposed to, how do I represent the very thing that Jesus came to abolish? Like, that's the call of the church. That we are the body of Christ and we want to reflect that. So that means, uh, and if I could push on this one too, church, like have friends that aren't in church. Like strategically, find people, like whether it's in your offices, finding a place that you can be a regular, uh, coaching Little League, doing something like that where you can build relationships with people that don't know you. Understanding that they've probably had some bad church experiences or some bad, you know, whatever experience. They might have wrong understandings and they definitely don't know exactly who Jesus is and how much Jesus loves them. And then take that as an opportunity to go, I get the opportunity to bring light into this place and and to be a picture and a testimony of who Jesus is for them in a way that they haven't ever seen before. And watch and see how fun that is. Watch and see what it's like to see Jesus using you to bring people to salvation in Christ, whether you're just bringing them to church, whether you're leading them yourself, whatever the case may be, it is a joy to do. Amen, church? Let's stand and pray. Jesus, we just thank you that we we get to see these stories and we just remember once again that you as king of the world were the ultimate insider and yet you became an outsider so that we might be brought in. What a beautiful testimony that is. Father, help us to be humble. Help us to be childlike. Help us to be gracious in that way. 
And Lord, for those of us here that, that have never put our faith in Jesus, I pray, God, that you would just break down those walls, that you would pull on their heart and soul and show them the reality of who you are. I pray, God, you would continue putting people around them in their life that, that know Jesus and that can accurately reflect him. And I, I pray, God, that you would break down barriers of pride and that you would grant childlike faith and that you would save so that no one walks out of this room without knowing you. And Lord, for those of us here that do, that are part of the family of God, Lord, may you continue to grow us, as your word says in Corinthians, molding us from glory to glory, more and more and more into the image of your beloved son, that we might reflect you accurately. Let us not be a crowd that when people see us, they're not seeing who Jesus really is. But Lord, may when people look at us, may they understand your grace and your mercy and your love and your mission. For the son of man came to seek and save that which is lost. So we just thank you, Lord, for this reminder. We praise you for your grace and mercy and pray that your Holy Spirit would protect, Lord, these understandings and produce fruit in our lives as we leave this place, Lord. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.